If I were to make up a 53-man roster right now for the 2024 New Orleans Saints, undrafted free agent tight end Dallin Holker would definitely make the cut. We got all that and a little bit of land yet for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Houdat Nation and Houdat family? I'm your host, Ross Jackson, New Orleans native, your New Orleans Saints expert and credential member of the media covering those New Orleans Saints as a senior writer and reporter over at Saints News Network. And on today's episode of Locked On Saints, Locked On's newest Locked On LSU host is here to make an introduction and to break down some of the Bayou Bengals Saints fans might want to keep an eye out on in 2024 and why linebacker Kendrick Perkins isn't one of them. We're also going to take a look at why Pete Werner must impress in 2024. And to kick us off here, three offensive players that have absolutely raised their stock during OTAs and minicamps, starting off with fan favorite tight end, Dallin Holker. We appreciate you very much, as always, for being an everydayer here on the show and for making Locked On Saints your first listen of the day here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And today's episode of Locked On Saints is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel, where you can make every moment more. Right now, new customers are going to get $200 in bonus bets by winning your first $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets by winning a $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. So look, if I'm making a 53-man roster right now for the New Orleans Saints, undrafted free agent Dallin Holker is making the cut. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And he would be one of the few UDFAs or undrafted free agents that would make the list because for me, he's one of the guys that helped himself the most over the course of both the three OTA practices that were open to media and the three minicamp practices that were open to media. He was outstanding getting first team reps, second team reps, third team reps, playing with all three quarterbacks, seemed to have some really nice connections with all three of those quarterbacks, including starting quarterback Derek Carr, made some near impossible catches, one of which uh, in the back of the end zone with a cornerback, cornerback covering him, right? Because he was operating out of the slot. Um, The ball gets thrown to him, gets tipped in the air by Demario Davis in a red zone drill, And Dallin Holker fights off that cornerback, comes up with the catch in the back of the end zone with the toe drag swag at the end to stay in bounds for a tutty. I mean, look, he was awesome. He was absolutely awesome. Um, And I think that he has helped himself big time. And look, he's aided now a little bit too, or was aided a little bit too, with Juwan Johnson not being able to participate in minicamps. Being injured is never a good thing. But look, other opportunities, other players have to step into those roles. Those roles then become opportunities for those players. Dallin Holker got that opportunity and absolutely took advantage of it. Didn't see him miss many passes. Didn't see him put anything really on the ground. Not a guy with dropsy hands or anything like that. Just safe, athletic, fast, and multiple. You can move them all over the place on this offense. I think right now, Dallin Holker is one of the three players that I think helped themselves the most. Now, look, I'm going to stick with non quarterbacks as I go through the other two guys here. We got to give a nod to Jake Hayner. Jake Hayner absolutely raised his stock, especially at me being a guy who is effectively a doubter when it comes to Jake Hayner, simply because I tend to doubt under six foot quarterbacks in the league, right? There's a very small list of those players that actually pan out, but Jake Hayner has looked really good despite that. But I'm going to leave him out of this conversation, but I do want to give him a nod. I'm going to stick with non QBs here. Let's go next to wide receiver Cedric Wilson, uh, Wilson, excuse me, another one that I would absolutely put on the roster right now if I had to. And if I was making a 53 man roster, Um, his role is specific. His contributions are unique. His play is consistent. He he is an experienced veteran, just kind of checks a lot of boxes. The Saints don't have a lot of veteran presence when it comes to their wide receiver room right now. Chris Olave going into his third year. A.T. Perry going into his second year, Rashid Shahid going into his third year, right? Then you have a lot of other guys uh, like uh, Kyle Sheets, who was just waived, undrafted free agent. Bub Means coming in as a rookie. Uh, Mason Tipton coming in as an undrafted free agent as well in his first year. Not a lot of veteran experience across this roster when it comes to running back, or excuse me, when it comes to wide receiver. So having a guy 
like Cedric Wilson, who's played multiple on multiple teams in multiple years in the NFL, five years in the NFL now. Um, yeah, there's value there. Uh, but it's not just about can he be the guy with the experience because you can have all the experience you want. Doesn't mean you're going to be good. So when you go out there and you have the experience and you're good, which is what Cedric Wilson has proven about himself here, um, I think that that helps a ton. And so guys like him and Equinemius St. Brown, who has also helped himself quite a bit, Stanley Morgan Jr., those three guys coming in as the UDFAs, or not the UDFAs, I'm so sorry, but as the experienced guys, right, the guys who have been in the league for multiple years, they have to be able to go out there and prove something. And I think that Cedric Wilson is the one out of that trio that has gotten out there to prove the most, being fair to Stanley Morgan Jr., who is still coming back from injury and therefore hasn't gotten the opportunity to go out there and prove anything just yet, but looks like he's going to get that chance uh, in training camp. The Saints signed a new tight end, uh, which we'll discuss here in a little bit, where they signed a new tight end. And in the process, they waived undrafted free agent wide receiver Kyle Sheets, didn't waive Stanley Morgan Jr. So it seems that they're intent on at least getting Stanley Morgan Jr. into training camp and getting a look at him. But man, if there's one of these guys at wide receiver that has really made the roster for me, it's Cedric Wilson over the course of OTAs and minicamp. Now, of course, you don't make the roster in OTAs. You don't make the roster in minicamp. You make the roster in training camp. So that's where these guys are all going to have to really, really prove uh, what they can be. But they're going to have the opportunities. Cedric Wilson's going to be the third and or fourth wide receiver in rotations, whether he's playing in the slot or on the outside will change kind of where he is there. And then Dallin Holker is probably going to get some opportunity, at least for the first couple of weeks of training camp, with there being an expectation that Juwan Johnson getting his surgery this week probably isn't going to necessarily be ready to start camp. And even if he is, it's going to be a ramp up, right? So it's going to be slow beginnings for him. So Cedric Wilson, as well as Dallin Holker, are going to have those opportunities going into training camp. My final player in terms of who raised their stock here uh, over the course of OTAs and minicamp, you might think I'm crazy for saying this, all right? Because can this guy really raise his stock? Um, isn't he already kind of, don't, doesn't everybody already know what, he's, what he, his contribution level is and all these other things? That, that's totally possible. But I, I have to put Taysom Hill on this list. And look, I know I said not, I'm not putting quarterbacks on this list, but Taysom Hill did not raise his stock as a quarterback. He raised his stock as an offensive weapon and as a special teamer more and more and more every single time that we saw him. Clint Kubiak is going to have so much fun with the way that he utilizes Taysom Hill. And Taysom Hill is going to be so much fun being a more consistent part of this offense than he's ever been so far. I, I completely believe that that is going to be the case with Taysom Hill, is that his presence, his contribution, his usage, the way that the team utilizes him, his uh, his his the uh, this, the the all the different places that he plays, it's all going to be so multiple. It's all going to be so varied. It's just going to be a ton of fun. And I think that Taysom Hill has proven yet again, not only is he deserving of that ten million dollar per year contract as the player that leads the team in touchdowns, rushing and receiving touchdowns in the last three seasons with twenty, but also that we haven't even seen his final form yet. And I'm hoping, hoping based upon what we've seen during the course of OTAs and minicamp that we're about to see that final form here in 2024. For me, Taysom Hill has never been more exciting than he is right now and shouldn't be more exciting than he will be uh, in Clint Kubiak's offense in 2024. But let's see what happens when they actually hit the field. Coming up next, why Pete Werner must impress in 2024 and who he should be looking at. Another fellow defensive player that was in a situation very recently, just like what Pete Werner's in right now, for some inspiration. We got that coming up for you as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. Put a Locked on Podcast Network, your team, every day. Today's episode of Locked on Saints is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Summertime means baseball, the NBA Finals, and more, and you can bet on all of it over at FanDuel today. Right now, new customers are going to get $200 in bonus bets by winning a $5 bet. That's it. That's 200 bucks, and you can then use on everything from finals MVP to who's going to hit one out of the park just by winning a $5 bet. So if bet on a heavy favorite, if you hit it, then boom, 200 bucks in your pocket. And right now, we can put the brooms away for the Dallas Mavericks. They staved off the sweep, but it looks like it could very well be Celtics in five. Right now, FanDuel has the Celtics favored heavily, six and a half points to close things out and win the NBA Finals. So if you want to get on that, FanDuel is the place to go. Specifically, FanDuel.com slash locked on so you can add a big win to your summer bucket list. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. 
All right, family, with the massive free agent addition of linebacker Willie Gay, contract year for Pete Warner here in 2024, it gets even more important as a make or break season for the former Ohio State linebacker. What does he have to do to hang on? What is the true competition around him and who should he be looking to emulate over on the defensive side in order to win whatever battle might be there? We're going to break all of that down as we take a look at Pete Werner and why he needs to impress here in 2024. We appreciate you very much for making us your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget to go and check out Locked On Sports today, the first ever national sports 24-7 stream on YouTube. And it gives you all the biggest stories from around the league covered by the people that actually know the teams the best the local experts here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Make sure you go and check it out. You can find it for free on YouTube and on the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Just search Locked On Sports today. Part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. New Orleans Saints linebacker Pete Werner is in for a very, very important season here in 2024 and will be looking to hold off the potential of losing snaps in the process. In order for him to get that right, here's what he needs to achieve. He has to achieve consistency. It's been a few years now, right? It's been three seasons of Pete Werner thus far, and he has been a solid linebacker. I'm a little bit higher on him than some of the folks that I know around me are, but the reason why is because I've seen it, right? You've seen the production. It's not a situation like years and years and years ago when you're watching some of these uh, previously not so strong New Orleans Saints linebacking cores. I think we can be honest about the Saints history at this position. Um, eh, you never saw it. You never really saw it, the thing, the it factor, whatever it might be. You just never saw the consistent play. So it wasn't necessarily that you were waiting for it to be consistent. It was simply that like you never really saw it in the first place. With Pete Werner, you can see it. Several seasons now, at the beginning of the year, he is at the top of the list when it comes to solo tackles across the league. We've seen some playmaking ability from him, uh, getting you know getting involved in takeaways, things like that. I'll never forget the Olamide Zacchaeus uh, punch out that he had against the Atlanta Falcons years ago on the Falcons wide receiver that allowed them to be able to continue that storming comeback years ago. Um, this is who Pete Werner has proven he can be. The issue has been maintaining that level of production over the course of 17 games. And look, it doesn't mean that you have to have 10 tackles and a takeaway 17 games straight. You're not going to have that, but it can't be a disappearing act mid-season or a disappearing act for some, you know, or not even really a disappearing act. You just can't go quiet over the course of a solid multi-game stretch, which is what we've seen from Pete Werner in the past. And even me saying that still feels a little unfair, but look, this is the way that you're judged in the NFL. You're not necessarily judged by the peak of your performance. You're judged by what your middle road is, what's your consistency. What do you do consistently well, consistently great, consistently poorly in some cases? I don't think that that's a factor when it comes to Pete Werner. So I think for me, the big thing that the Saints are going to be looking for from him is going to be that consistency. The majority of the games, can he show up and have an impact? And that impact can come in the run game with the you know double digit tackle games. It can come in coverage, right? Which is the one place where, look, they picked on him a lot. I got a lot of 20, 20, 20 written in my, um, in my notes from charting plays, not all of them because he's giving up plays, but just simply because he's been targeted in pass coverage a lot. I think the Saints are pushing him in that way. And uh, that's a good thing. Push those players at this point so that they're ready for it come the season. I also am curious about how much now being more consistently exposed to the style of offense the New Orleans Saints are now playing, which is what the most explosive offenses in the NFL are doing, or some version of it uh, is what they're doing. How much this, these reps, these May, June, July and August reps end up making his play more consistent come October, November, December, right? Se September has never really been a question for Pete Werner. He's typically out the gate big time. But what does he look like when the holidays start to roll around, right? Like that's what you're looking for in terms of that consistency factor. So how much of a challenge really stands before him right now? And I look, I think that the addition of Willie Gay 
is really more about having three linebackers, right? Like that's the that's the priority is having three solid linebackers that can be starters, that can go out for you, they can play um, in any configuration of pairs. You could have Pete Werner and Willie Gay. You can have uh, Demario Davis and Pete Werner, or you can have Demario Davis and Willie Gay, and you're probably pretty comfortable with any of those combinations. That's unique for today's NFL landscape. But the other thing is, is that as we've seen offenses get heavier, more two tight end sets, more two running back sets, more inclusion and uh, utilization of fullbacks, all the things that the New Orleans Saints are trying to do this season in 2024, it means you have to have three linebackers that can be on the field together as well. And so I think that's a big reason in terms of pri- the priority, right? The number one impact that Willie Gay has. But Willie Gay could, in those snaps, when there are three linebackers on the field, do things that prove him to be more uh, a greater contributor as a playmaker, a greater contributor of consistency, a greater contributor of energy, of hype, of all of these other things that make a big time impact, in particular in a New Orleans Saints defense that wants you to just simply be better than the guy out in front of you. Um, it, that could prove him to be more valuable on the field and then begin to challenge for some of those Pete Werner snaps. So while, while working together as a you know, symbiotic unit, the three of them is very important. There is an element of prove it here for Pete Werner that I think he's going to feel. Like I think there's some of that I got to show them that I should be the one on the field when it's two linebackers next to, or when it's two linebackers and somebody's got to line up next to DeMario. So I think that that's that's where the challenge really comes in. And now too, the other thing is Pete Werner's in a contract year. So even beyond the immediate competition of 2024 snaps, what about your 2025 future, your 2026 future, so on and so forth? Is it with this team? He'll begin to kind of solidify all of that here in 2024. And the good news for him is that he's not far away either in lineup or locker room from a guy that just recently went through this and shut down all conversation about it very quickly in cornerback Paul Sinadibo. Keep in mind that when Paul Sinadibo was on this roster and then a guy like Alante Taylor was drafted, some folks talked a lot about how Alante Taylor could potentially push Paul Sinadibo for his starting role opposite Marshawn Lattimore. A lot of that conversation happened. But here's the thing. Paul Sinadibo did not let that conversation go on. I, I, I would bet that some folks don't even remember that conversation being a conversation because of what Paul Sinadibo was able to turn around and do last year. And remember, the year before that, Alante Taylor's first year, his rookie year, he got some opportunities out there while Adibo was dealing with some injuries, while Marshawn Lattimore was dealing with some injuries, and looked really good playing at outside corner. And then all of a sudden, Paul Sinadibo had kind of the down year when he was dealing with injuries and all these other things. And everybody kind of went, oh, so then there's going to be a competition on the outside between Alante and Paul Sinadibo. And Paul Sinadibo said, uh-uh. He going to have to learn a whole new position to get on this field because he ain't getting on the field above me. He going to have to get on the field with me. And I know he didn't actually say that, but that's definitely what his performance said because Paul Sadibo had a stellar year last year and is in line to have a stellar year again here in 2024. And that's a place where maybe a guy like Pete Werner could take a little bit of inspiration and say, hey, I'm going to do it like he did it. Coming up next, I'm so happy to help announce the return of Matt Moscona to the Locked On Podcast Network, returning to Locked On LSU. Had him come on the show here today to bring you a little bit of insight into some LSU Tigers you might want to be paying attention to over the course of the 2024 college football season, and also a good look at uh, just what he's got in store for you over at Locked On LSU. Can't wait to chat with him. We got him coming up here as we continue on with today's episode of Locked On Saints, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Get it, Houdat Nation. Matt Moscona is officially back here on the Locked On Podcast Network, the new and returning host of Locked On LSU, and he's here today to help us take a look at some LSU Tigers that Saints fans might want to at least keep a little bit of an eye on during the college football season here in 2024. We appreciate you very much for being here. Don't forget, we are your team every day. Coming up tomorrow, typically undrafted free agents have to prove that they can contribute on special teams if they want to make a roster, but one undrafted free agent defender 
is proving that he can have an impact from his position. We're taking a look at three defensive players that help themselves big time during OTAs and minicamp. But for now, I am so excited to wrap up today's episode discussing with our good friend Matt Moscona at Matt Moscona on your favorite social media after further review over at ESPN Baton Rouge, The Morning Scone, and now Locked on LSU again is here to help us break down some of these LSU Tigers you're going to want to keep an eye out on on the 2024 season. And I asked him to start everything off about the biggest name for the LSU Tigers, linebacker Kendrick Perkins, and whether or not he could be a new fit or a good fit for the New Orleans Saints come 2025. Here's what Matt had to say. The fascinating thing about Perkins is he's he exploded onto the scene as a freshman as an edge rusher. But Harold's push before his sophomore year was he wanted to be an off-ball linebacker. He wanted to be a three-down guy to show the NFL that he could be a three-down guy. Smart. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem is he spent all offseason trying to be a three-down off-ball linebacker, and after one game, he got caught up in the wash against Florida State, and he never did it again the rest of the year. <laughs> and so he kind of played this nickel Sam role. He'd stand up mm -hmm. on the edge and rush the passer, and that's really his strength though, Ross. Like, Harold Perkins is a freakishly athletic guy. He... He can turn and run with a back out of the backfield. He can cover a tight end. One of the turning plays of the season, quite honestly, was an interception he had downfield in coverage against Missouri on the road in a game where LSU couldn't get a stop. And then they finally got one when Perkins got an interception downfield. And we know he can rush the passer. The real question is, at 225 pounds, like, can he take on an SEC interior offensive lineman, get a block, and make a tackle in the hole? And that's what yeah, he hasn't yeah. proven he can do. Now, LSU's got a new defensive coordinator, Blake Baker, and Blake Baker is also the linebacker's coach, and he has insisted, Baker, that Harold Perkins has the physical ability to do that. It's just a matter of reps. So they're giving him the opportunity this whole offseason again to see if he can do it. But, Ross, like, it's, it's fair to be skeptical. Like, physically, just as far as ability, Harold Perkins is a first-round talent. There's no question about that. Can he actually be a three-down off-ball linebacker? That's a big question that he's got to answer this year uh, for LSU. Boy, that's got... And, and just thinking about the New Orleans Saints and their past over the defensive side, that kind of has Zach Bond <laughs> written all over yeah. it again, doesn't it? Good you know, job. guy that maybe you know, ends up playing better at the collegiate level as an edge rusher, but then lands in a system where they don't use him that way might not be the greatest fit, it sounds like. The other thing, too, like one... Thing that may make sense is the way that Clemson used Isaiah Simmons, ah, which great. made yep, him into yep. this freak show top 10 pick of the Cardinals, and it just never worked with the way they used him. So I really think for Harold, mm -hmm. the system he goes into and how a team chooses to use him is gonna is gonna matter because he has a dynamic skill set. You know, some LSU fans will say, Well, he's like Micah Parsons. No, Micah Parsons is 260 pounds. Like right. Harold Perkins yeah, is 25 pounds less than that and two inches shorter. He's, mm -hmm. he's not a guy that in the NFL is going to take on freakishly athletic left tackles. So how how he fits in, in the NFL game, I think, is really going to map to how he plays this year. Yeah, that's huge. All right. Well, future future Philadelphia Eagle then, uh, Harold Perkins. <laughs> Let's take a look at it. <laughs> Let's take a look at maybe another guy. Look, the Saints trying to answer the question of what their long-term bookends are going to be uh, over on the offensive line. Is there a, a tackle or an offensive lineman that could potentially make sense for Saints fans to watch this season? Well, I mean, I know you've talked a ton about both, you know, Fuanga and, and Penning. Um mm -hmm. And what may happen with those guys. But if the Saints go into the draft next year, first of all, Ron, if the Saints go into the draft next year needing another first round pick at offensive line, woof. Uh, woof. <laughs> um, like my hope is Taliese Fuanga becomes an awesome left tackle and Trevor mm -hmm. Penning finds his home at right tackle. But let's just say yeah, hypothetically yeah. best case scenario for sure. It, Will Campbell won't be on the board. If, mm -hmm. if the Saints have an opportunity to pick Will Campbell, this season went horribly wrong and they have a whole new coaching staff because Will Campbell and everybody's way too early mocks is basically this year's Joe Alt. He's the first mm -hmm. off ta offensive tackle that's going to be taken. He is absolutely a top 10 pick, could be top five, provided he's healthy and everything goes along. We all hope for that, of course. But the more interesting guy I would say would be Emory Jones. So Emory Jones is uh, sure. the right tackle who's started since his freshman year and you're seeing him kind of as a late teens or 20s picks in a lot of the early mm -hmm. mock drafts. And that may that may fit where the Saints might be picking. And like I could play out this hypothetical, Ross. 
let's say Taliesi Fuwanga really locks down left tackle, but Penning mm-hmm. just can't play tackle in the NFL. Maybe they kick him into left guard. He beats out Salvador. Sure. Mm-hmm. Maybe next year you are looking for a right tackle. And the Saints love to draft linemen uh, in the first round, and Emory Jones could be a fit there. Look, I saw Emory play at, at Catholic High in Baton Rouge, and he was a left tackle in high school. He is absolutely athletic enough to play left tackle, but it's just one of those deals where you got the best left tackle in college football, Will Campbell. Mm-hmm. So Emory plays on the right side. Like I'll put it to you this way. If Will Campbell tweaks an ankle or is sick or something like that, Emory Jones is kicking over and playing left tackle mm-hmm. for LSU. I see. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, I think he could play either at the next level, but it might be a thing where best case for the Saints, Fuanga left tackle. And well, the best case is Penning works out. But if not, yeah. you, you could look at Emory Jones. That's more realistic, I think. Yeah, I think that's the calmest I've ever heard you say Catholic high, by the way. Uh, like I've ever heard you say that. Your audience. See, there's a big difference <laughs> when I'm on my show with my audience, and I can be as, <laughs> as obnoxious as I want about the greatest high school in the history of the world, which, by the way, just won a baseball national championship. Right. Ross, Max Preps, number one in the country, piggybacking a football national or a football state championship this past fall. All we do is hang Thank banners you. and collect trophies. How you like me now? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Things things going well. Things going well. Uh, obviously, there you go. Uh, you know, we 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 have fun here. Uh, obviously, a lot more of that over on Locked at LSU. We're super excited that Matt is back. Matt, uh, how about you know? Look, uh, Chris Olave set to be a star this year, right? He's set to be the number one guy in this offense. Rashid Shahid is electrifying, but then there's kind of that group after that to where you're looking at guys that maybe fall into that kind of role player tag that could grow from there. Are there wide receivers that potentially make sense for this offense? I think that might be the deepest outside of offensive line receiver may be the deepest position on LSU's team again this year. And that's after losing Malik neighbors, Brian Thomas, both in the first round. Yeah, That's big. So Kyron Lacey looks like he's ready to be the next guy, but Ross, I also don't think the saints would be looking to pull the trigger on a first round receiver next year. I think a lot of stud. I think you agree with me on that. I think you've got your game breaker and Rashid Shahid. Yep. I'm kind of looking at, is there a, is there somebody that makes sense in the slot that can be a dynamic mm-hmm. player there? And two guys maybe worth keeping an eye on are two guys that just transferred into LSU. So CJ Daniels was a thousand yard receiver at Liberty. And so it's mm-hmm. the portal allows for for guys like this to to make a big leap, Ross. It, Daniels goes, he's a thousand yard receiver at Liberty. Well, now he has the opportunity to go say, let me go prove it to the NFL that I can do it in the SEC as well. Yeah. And Daniels is a guy who may very well line up in the slot, create mismatches, and be a really dynamic player for LSU. I think that would be intriguing. Also, Xavion Thomas, who's a New Orleans kid who wasn't recruited by right. LSU out of high school, went to Mississippi State, was their leading receiver this past year, transferred into LSU. He also is a guy that returns kicks and punts. So mm-hmm. the dynamic of being maybe like your fourth receiver and a guy that can return kicks and punts for you makes Xavion Thomas really interesting as well. But there's no shortage of talent there, man. And I, I know the last time the Saints drafted an LSU receiver was was Devery Henderson you know, 22 years ago. Mm-hmm. But that's those two guys would be really interesting just because it's not necessarily the Malik Neighbors, the Brian Thomas, the number one guy on the outside that you already have, but a guy I right. think that would be a really nice compliment in uh, in the Saints offense. Yeah, absolutely. The Saints throughout their history haven't gone more than, I believe it's nine years without drafting an LSU player at some point within the draft. Last guy they drafted would have been Will Clapp, 2018. So, you know, getting closer and closer to kind of like that timeline (laughs) of when it makes sense to grab somebody. So could be, could be this year. Matt, look, dude, we're, we're all super stoked, man. We're so happy that you're back. Matt, of course, as I mentioned in the intro, back now hosting Locked in LSU again. You want to give the Saints fans slash, you know how the overlap goes. A lot of LSU yeah, fans as well. A little bit of insight on what you're bringing to the show. And, uh, you know, just uh, it, it's awesome having you back, dude. Ross, I mean, well, I'm glad you mentioned the overlap because the overlap is me. I mean, like I right. was born yeah, in New Orleans. Go. Same. Dude, Sundays for me were church, Shoney's breakfast, buffet, dome. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> but, but Saturdays were we would we would drive up from New Orleans and we'd go tailgate on the old front nine and and go to the Tiger games. So, and I went to LSU. I mean, so I am I am the crossover fan, right? That yeah. That l- these are my that you cut me. I'm black and gold, purple and gold. So mm-hmm. I love both. Um, yeah, man. And I'm really really excited to be back. So I you know, started locked on LSU back in 2018 and did the podcast for four years. Had to step away. Caroline Fenton did an awesome job the last two years. She 
is on to a great new challenge in her career. And so the spot opened back up and the folks at Locked On were super generous to welcome me back. And I could not be more excited to be back. I mean, to watch like what, what you've done and what obviously what Jake's done over with Locked On Pelicans and just the network as a whole, how much it's grown. It's, I mean, Ross, not a lot of people win in, in this space the way that Locked On has. And to be part of the team and have seen it grow over the last six years since I've been both directly and indirectly involved is awesome, man. And I'm very, very, very genuinely happy to be back on the team and super grateful for the opportunity because like, they didn't have to welcome me back, man. They could have gone another direction. <laughs> and um, But I'm really excited to be doing this again. All right, family. One more big thank you to Matt Moscona at Matt Moscona on your favorite social media. Make sure you're going and you're checking out Locked on LSU every day for the daily download and what's going on with your Bayou Bengals. Nobody does it better than Matt Moscona. So make sure you go and check that out. We appreciate you very much for joining us here for another episode. I will see you tomorrow as we take a look at three defensive players who helped themselves during OTAs and minicamp. We appreciate you very much for making us a part of your day, part of your routine for saying yes to me and the show. As always, if you see me, please say hi. And if you need anything else around your New Orleans Saints in between these episodes, make sure you follow me on your favorite social media at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how you mom and them. I trust you, that nation. I'll holla at you. How you like me now? Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>